So, Georgie, when you're ready. All right, so uh, I would like to tell everybody that I'm wearing a jumpsuit today and it has pockets. Woo! Now, <laughs> why, why is this important? Okay, so a lot of the time I shop in the women's department, in clothing stores, and sometimes there are no pockets or sometimes the pockets are like so shallow you can't even put like, I don't know, one, one digit in there. So when I think about this jumpsuit, I think that someone has thought, Someone's going to use pockets when they wear this jumpsuit. And so I feel like someone has thought about me and considered that I, have, I might have a need to put something in my pocket, which I have my phone in there. Um, I could go on all day talking about clothes, because I, I like clothes but, and I like fashion, but uh, we're going to talk about design. Is anyone here a designer? <coughs> Ooh, quite a few. Uh, is anyone here, uh, did anyone here like used to be a designer? Okay, so I am not a designer, uh, but I'm going to talk about how you can make your website more accessible. Um, as you all know, I'm Georgie. I'm from Sydney. Um, I was born here, uh, grew up in Western Sydney. Uh, I work as a user interface engineer at a company called Campaign Monitor. We provide email marketing software for our customers. Uh, so while my, most people think of accessibility, um, I mean, when most pe people think of accessibility, they think of people with visible and invisible disabilities, including but not limited to blindness, deafness, autism, Alzheimer's, dyslexia, and making experiences more accessible to them. But uh, accessible design in the context of the web and the internet is not just about making websites accessible to these people. It's about including these people and making the internet accessible to everyone. This means not only permanent impairments, but temporary ones, such as a broken arm, which was the example that Jess B uh, gave yesterday, um, such as a pregnant woman, or even someone recovering from eye surgery. It also includes situational impairments. Uh, even though you likely wouldn't use, use your phone while, while driving, your hands are generally not available to do much else when you're driving. Uh, another example is a construction worker on a noisy site being unable to hear someone else's voice above the noise. And maybe someone on the train just holding onto a handrail. They only have one hand free. So the first thing we'll talk about uh, is in the category of typography. And we want to give everyone a comfortable experience while reading text on the web. So we'll start easy and talk about text. Uh, make your font size bigger. So I really hope <laughs> that that is big enough for all of you at the back. So if you are sitting a fair distance from a screen, uh, and if you've ever done live coding in a meeting or a presentation, chances are someone's asked you to bump up the font size. You might even have done it automatically because you know that it's not big enough for people sitting further up the back of the room. So when you're working with your website, consider that someone using it might have maybe forgotten their reading glasses, but they can read if the text is big enough. Perhaps they have no impairments with their vision at all, but they might have an injury that impairs their um, movement, so they might be seated further away from the screen uh, than just right in front of your laptop or at your desk. Or um, it might even just be a younger child who can more easily read large letters than smaller ones. Uh, when setting font size on a website using a CSS, it's recommended that you don't use pixels, uh, but use the REM unit to allow text to scale proportionally. Uh, values in REM will be based on the size that is set on the body element, which is uh, 16 pixels for um, most browsers. Uh, a good tip for making uh, your web when making your website mobile friendly is to actually make your font size slightly larger on a smaller screen, especially with body text. It might sound strange because larger text would take up more space on a smaller screen, but if you think about a lot of small text squeezed into a smaller space, it's actually more challenging to read. Like let's say an encyclopedia that's rather large, but all the text is super tiny. It's also a good rule of thumb to ensure that the number of characters per line stays at a maximum of 50 to 60. It's actually a general recommendation for ease of readability. Wider than this means that the reader will have a hard time focusing on the text as it becomes more difficult to discern where the beginning and the end of each line is. Too much narrower 
can have its downsides too. It can break the rhythm because the reader's eyes are frequently travelling back and forth between <coughs> the end of the, li uh, end of the line to the beginning of the next line. So adding a maximum width to the content on your website does depend on your choice of font and font size, but you can generally do this in CSS by adding max, something like max width 50, 55, 56 rem to the outer wrapper of your main body of text. And talk about white space. Larger text goes hand in hand with adequate white space. It's really important for text to have breathing room so that it's easy to read. When the space between lines of text is very close together, it becomes more difficult to read from the end of one line to the beginning of the next line. So this is a blog post from my blog. Um, you can find it by Googling Hey Georgie, and it comes up after all the Pennywise pictures from the It movie. <laughs> Um, this is what it looks like, uh, like as an exact screenshot. And this is where I've made the line height a little bit smaller. You might be surprised to know that this line height is 1.5, but it still feels a little squishy. So this line height as it is on my blog is actually 1.8. The distance between text and other elements, such as images, shouldn't be too small either. Text often accompanies images, but we look at an image and read its accompanying text separately. So enough space needs to separate them so that we can visually make this distinction without a struggle. Too many different elements in one area without enough white space can make it difficult for a user to locate what they're looking for, be it navigation, simply reading the body text, looking for a search bar, or scanning the page for a heading. By the way, this was partially built with CSS Grid. Shout out to Amy. Uh, so don't be afraid to be generous with white space because it can provide a more comfortable reading experience. Next, we have color contrast, perhaps the most important uh, but most common uh, accessibility consideration. There needs to be enough color contrast between text and background for the text to be legible. Seems easy, right? Unfortunately, it's not really that way. Many government websites need to meet the uh, Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, also known as the WCAG, WCAG for some people. Uh, it's a document of website accessibility guidelines for font size, color, and interactivity. Color contrast between text and background needs to have a high ratio to meet these guidelines. Black text on a white background is excellent, but if you think about a light gray or even a medium gray text on a white background, maybe not so much. Color um, and font size go hand in hand too, so it's good to consider both. So as you check color contrast ratios for the websites you build, you'll soon find that very few color combinations have a high enough contrast ratio, and it's tricky because sometimes we want our websites to look bright and colorful. Um, so my slides used to have this color uh, on them, and I had used it as a as the whole background with some white text on it, and as you can imagine, uh, it's probably going to look a lot worse than that negative, or that terrible contrast ratio. So we need to consider that while something might actually uh, look like it has enough contrast to us or that we can read it, it does not mean that everyone can. Good design doesn't just look good. Good design should feel good to use. I'm going to go into semantic HTML, which Jess B touched on yesterday. Um, so accessibility actually starts from having universally acknowledged semantic markup. HTML makes up the skeleton of a website. Um, sadly, as amazing it, as it is, it can be very forgiving. It's not case sensitive, so you know if you write a div in uppercase, if you even do this, which is what I did back in like hmm, maybe when I was 11, <laughs> it would still it would still parse. It would still come out as a div. The browser would go, oh okay, keep trying to parse it without throwing you any kind of error. And so this actually kind of led to HTML being reprimanded as being easy. And code quality considerations often left behind as well. But HTML makes up such an integral part of websites, so meaningful structure is important. We saw a couple of examples from just yesterday, but there are uh, some other semantic elements that we can use beyond the div, which um, uh, 
such as article for the article content on a blog, section for a distinct area of a website. Um, the, I haven't written this down there, but this footer for a footer. Um, header for a header. <laughs> button for a button where we used to use input previously. Uh, there's time for the time in a specified time format. And we also have menu uh, for a navigation menu of options and figure and fig caption are my secret favorite, which is what I used in the couple of slides before with the photos. So these elements have allowed us to add meaning to the structure of our websites, making information easier for machines to process, but also meaning that users using assistive technologies, such as screen readers, which you should all know about by now, or navigating using keyboard will have a smoother experience using the web. It's also important to mark up forms correctly, inputs, need labels, inputs belong in forms, and a placeholder is not a label. So if we use a placeholder as a label, it's not accessible, and the placeholder uh, text disappears when a user interacts with the input. This is an example of what it might look like. That color contrast is so bad, by the way. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, is anyone a fan of Back to the Future? Yeah. All right, I'm, I'm Marty, and I'm typing my name in. Start typing my email, and then uh, halfway through typing it in, I'm like, wait, what? What is this? What is this? This field that I'm typing in. I'm going to have to remove backspace what I've typed in there to see this placeholder text which says email, as it did on the previous slide. So it's much better to have these labels visible. So whatever I type in there, um, I will know what the purpose of that field is. So logical order of elements. When writing HTML, it's important to consider this uh, and how the elements are on the page logically, regardless of design and without considering style and positioning. So we saw in Amy's talk yesterday before she applied any of the CSS grid uh, styles that uh, she just uh, showed us the HTML and what it looked like. So it doesn't matter if your design looks like this or like this, where you have an image uh, under text or maybe next to it, maybe on the other side. Does not matter if it looks like this, just like apart from each other, or if you've got some cool overlaying effect happening, or if you chose to do something wild here. Uh, these visual changes are styles that should be done with CSS, and the underlying HTML should be written in a logical order. So a heading, well, which I've made as the blue, uh, should generally set the tone and part of a document before an image or other media. So takeaway from this part is to read and write HTML like you would a regular document, like a page or a um, paper, and then consider the design and the CSS. Interactivity. We all love to say, click here, click on this, click on that, but not everyone is using a mouse, right? So hyperlinks, the past the source of the internet. You interact with a hyperlink and you're a different place, so they're a huge part of navigating the web and we see them quite frequently. If we're hovering over hyperlink, there's a 99.9% .9 chance that we're using a mouse maybe to position our cursor over the hyperlink. How do we know if we're hovering over a hyperlink? There's a change in style, color, perhaps underline added or removed, perhaps a background color added to the anchor text. Uh, it's important to make the visual difference clear. You may have noticed when you use the keyboard to tab through a website, and you probably saw this in Jess B's talk yesterday, you focus on elements such as links and inputs, and you can usually tell because of the outline around it. Uh, in the past, it was common to remove this outline because of its lack of appeal, just this kind of sort of ugly blue box happening. So keeping in mind what we know about color contrast, we can apply various different focus styles to an element so that users can discern when an element is focused and when it's not. This is what I've done on my blog. I've chosen to make the focus state really stand out and contrast with both the regular and hover states. Also, that's a legit CSS color called Peach Puff. I suggest you try and use it because it's really quite nice. So I mentioned this just a minute ago, non-device specific copy. Sometimes we use the word click here, or tap here, and it's used on websites and even emails and assumes that the user is using a mouse or their finger and it's not really inclusive, so we should try to use more universal copy 
such as select from the following menu rather than click an item, and maybe choose as well is another word. If you think of any other words, please let me know because those are the only two I've thought of, but good to think about regardless. Descriptive anchor text. Again, why are we using click here? It's not very, exclusive, it's not very inclusive and also not very descriptive of where this link is going to take you. Good anchor text will fluidly fit with the text that exists on your website and be descriptive of where the hyperlink will take you, like these examples. So we have a link that says, see new products. You know that when you click it, you're going to see new products. So another record written by Chris Wright. This guy's my manager. He's awesome. <laughs> Read Nick's blog post on the topic. Feel free to email me. Not click here to email me. So we were talking about fingers and tapping, many people on their smartphones for long periods of time, scrolling, using their hands to navigate. We need to make the tap targets large enough so that people can navigate a website easily. So smartphones have much smaller screens than a computer. Fingers are much bigger, not likely to have the same precision that a mouse pointer has. Screen real estate becomes smaller with each device, but a user's fingers and thumbs do not, unless you're a shapeshifter or I don't know. But Halloween's over, so. So bigger is better for tap targets as well. This, this includes stuff like hyperlinks, logos, images that are hyperlinked, other sort of interactive gestures. Should have large, uh, sufficient uh, target or hit area for someone's finger to interact with it. Uh, the recommendation is actually 44 pixels uh, as minimum for tap targets on the web, and that is from the Designing for Touch book. Uh, we should also avoid using hover to reveal important UI such as tooltips, mega menus. I uh, have an example here. Hover over, this is the Marvel style guide. Hover over it and you get a tooltip, which appears on hover. Random jewelry site. Hovering over all these uh, pieces of jewelry, we see another image of the product. The uh, mega menu at the top is also activated uh, on hover with your mouse. Airbnb blog, I thought they'd be better at this, but I don't see the title of any of these blog posts until I hover over them. So there are some options. You might decide these elements don't need to be activated on touchscreen devices, so maybe there's no minimal or no impact on the user's journey. Or you might decide, like uh, this Tourism Australia site, to just activate it on click instead, or tap as well. Uh, or you could uh, simply avoid designing a piece of interface where content is sort of hidden under a hover event. If, you're, if your use of these kinds of elements is excessive, it might suggest that your design needs to be rethought. So web performance, you're on the phone and you're like, oh, uh, Tom calling, uh, or on a call, and cuts out for a bit, and you're sorry, I went through a tunnel. So when you think of a beautiful website, you often think of crisp imagery, like the Q website. Uh, pictures of products have to be really clear and probably large to get people's attention. A custom font that pertains to the website's brand, like Airbnb and their serial typeface. Animations when you load or interact with the page. And this happens when you actually visit the website and it, and it loads, so this is the first thing that you see. Effects when you scroll down the page. I have one of these watches, but I'm, I'm not trying to sell it to you, <laughs> I promise. Big, beautiful, this is what we think of. Bold, dramatic. So there's a new standard when it comes to modern websites and making them beautiful, and it's kind of hurting the way we build on the web. These additional features result in a phenomenon called website bloat where the performance of our websites are impacted by a desire to meet this new standard and traditional practices become forgotten. So accessible inclusive design means considering our friends who are on slower connections, who work in remote areas, who are commuting to and from work, traveling through many tunnels, or maybe just working in their basement. I know we don't have basements in Australia, but <laughs> consider that custom fonts, scripts, High resolution images and a large amount of ads can slow down the performance and responsiveness of your website. So a good thing to consider is whether they truly add delight to the design and user experience. Do research to find out how you can implement these features while still considering performance, if you decide that they're necessary. 
But at the end of the day, form and function come first, bells and whistles are secondary. This ties in with a practice known as progressive enhancement. Start with the important core information and features that you need for an interface and that is accessible to primitive platforms in the market and then build upon that as the user's platform and bandwidth allow. It's okay if the layout isn't in a pretty grid because someone's using IE and CSS grid isn't supported. It's okay if someone isn't served the high resolution version of an image on a smartphone. It's okay if a select menu looks different across machines running different operating systems as long as I, as a user, am still able to select something from the menu. So if you've used Instagram, you probably remember the days when you couldn't zoom in on a photo. I remember showing my mom a photo only to have her try and zoom in and like the photo by mistake. Whew. Zooming and scrolling horizontally are two features that exist on browsers and devices by default. Uh, horizontal scrolling has, for some reason, had a reputation for being unattractive, but we should never assume that our users won't need this functionality because it's not considering uh, inclusive design. And this is an example of the select menu right before lunch. <laughs> we should not block users from using features that exist by default. So think of a website where you might have had a screen grab or screenshot in a tutorial. The screenshot's important, so we have to display it at full size. Horizontal scrolling is necessary uh, to see wha what appears on the far side of the image that probably doesn't really fit on your screen. So uh, remember the labels on the forms I mentioned? They were often forgotten about because people didn't realize that they were necessary <coughs> or disliked the browser defaults, when in fact they're an important part of accessibility. We may not, may not always like what the browser default looks like, but we should think about what functionality we are removing when we design and code. There may be very important reasons for these visuals and interactions to be present in the first place. Accessible design and inclusive design have been ignored in the past, not because developers chose to ignore them, but because of a lack of awareness. The examples I've outlined in this talk might seem like we need to relearn front-end development or are far from designing accessible interfaces, but this is not the case. Rather, we should approach the things we work on with newfound consideration and look at what we create with different perspectives. So next time you're tasked with putting a website together, remember that you're in power and with great power comes great responsibility. So spend extra time making considerations or working on implementations to improve the experience for a greater audience, for a wider spectrum of people, for everyone. Thank you. <laughs>